Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, dear members, and thank you all for joining us. It's been a while. Uh, tonight we have the huge honor of being enlightened with Sister Silma's wisdom and expertise. Just to introduce you, Sister Silma, um, although you need no introduction, Sister Silma Ihram is an Australian pioneer of Islamic education in Western Sydney. She is the founder and former school principal of Nur al Huda Islamic College. She has conducted research into the needs of Muslim converts and Muslim women at work. Sister Silma's passions are the welfare of children, ensuring the, that educational offerings meet the needs of students rather than students meeting the needs of schools, which I love, uh, and the deeper understanding of the beauty of Islam and its solutions for humanity as a whole. In this regard, uh, she's a frequent pre presenter in the media, especially the ABC program, The Drum. Uh, and on behalf of the Australian Muslim Women's Association, she responds to inquiries about Islam from media, students, converts, and community work workers. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Silma. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So tonight's theme is what I would have done differently, reflections of an Islamic school pioneer. And we have some big questions, if that's okay. Can we get started, inshallah? Uh, can you begin by telling us what about uh, a bit about your experience in starting an Islamic school in Australia. What was the impetus, uh, your key challenges and notable achievements? Okay, so I'll try and summarise it down to a very short space. Firstly, I so, alhamdulillah, thank you very much for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. Um, and I hope that something that I say might be of benefit tonight, and that's in, inshallah, with the will of Allah. So the first school I started was Al-Nuri, and the impetus for starting Al-Nuri was uh, the fact that there was no Muslim school. And I wanted to put my daughter into a safe place. So I took her, to, I took her into kindergarten um, at the school that I'd been to, which was... Uh, uh, Presbyterian Ladies College, PLC Croydon, and I asked them if she could not have to, uh, she could learn about the religion, but I didn't want her to be actively involved in following the religion. And the principal at the time, and he later denied it uh, to mm -hmm. me personally, the principal at the time said, our goal is to turn all our students into Christians, which is understandable for Christian school. I yeah. said, but my daughter is not a Christian, she's a Muslim. So um, I wasn't very happy at the interview and I walked out and I thought I'm going to start my own school, which was crazy because it was already November. <laughs> and so by February next, the following year, I'd read a book called Start Your Own School. And so that was the impetus that got started. We had four other um, women, um, a Pakistani sister, who's the mother of um, a sister Aisha Khan, who's the mother of Anissa Khan, who's very outspoken, a very amazing woman. Uh, a, a Lebanese sister and a Turkish sister um, and a, one other, I can't remember exactly who. So there were five of us all together and we started as a community school. So that what was the, you? that was 1983. Mashallah, very diverse for 1983. Yes, 1983. And it was the first um, all women's um, uh, um, project as far as I'm aware. So... Mm -hmm. um, and, and at the same time, Australian International Academy, which was called King Khalid School, started in, in Melbourne. So we both claimed sort of because one closed and one, we weren't registered for one and so on. So challenges. There were huge challenges. Firstly, uh, there was no Islamic model for a school. There were no qualified Muslim teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. We didn't have any Islamic curriculum. We didn't even have any curriculum. We had no money. Um, there was open hostility towards us. It took us nine moves and we had to move the school nine times. Um, oh, no. It was only four, unfortunately. And uh, it took um, uh, five, six years, six or seven years before we, before we were finally able to fight for a block of land and get registered. So we were not able to get registration until we got council approval and no council would give a Muslim school at that time approval. Like, so, so during that time, um, how about your daughter? Was she still attending the current school that you had registered? She was, she was attending my school as were uh, we, I think we got up to about 100 kids, 150 kids before we finally got registered. 
So, and we were known as the underground school. We were in the newspapers all the time. We were known as the illegal school and so on. So it, it was, <laughs> we, we were, we were kind of, and every time we moved in, in the end, I found out from the, um, the mayor of Canterbury, we uh, finally holed up in, in Canterbury Hall. It's called Sunshine Hall, which has now been pulled down in Canterbury, on Canterbury Road. And he came up to me once we finally got approval and he said, you know, I knew about you all those years when you were in Sunshine Hall, but I knew that if I closed you down, you'd just surface somewhere else. So I thought, that's safe and I can keep an eye on you. <laughs> and so oh, I let you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. Okay, so achievement. Oh, the other things that um, we just we really had challenges with, and I think they're still prevalent today, uh, patriarchy, uh, being an all, mostly in the end, converts who ran the school. We're the ones that, after a year or so, we're the ones that continued it. And a lot of the brothers were not prepared to see women running something. Like, who did you think you are? And especially converts, you know, who mm. do you think you are? We, we, we are the people. We are the, the leaders. We are, but they didn't have the focused idea how to run a school. Um, and I think other thing was um, uh, politics. So in the end, we lost the school to community politics as being the only school at the time. Everybody was after it. And so eventually there were a number of takeovers and, and we were moved on. So it was, um, it, it was fantastic. And so in terms of achievements, so I'll, I'll do as many as I can in the time we've got. I think one of the biggest things was that because we had so much media, we were constantly aware of the uh, challenge of representing Islam to Australians. So that really honed nearly all the kids who were there. Um, and we really made a big effort to reach out to other people. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, the little old lady, when we finally got to uh, approval, we had to go through two land environment court cases, very public ones. And we and the first one we were rejected and it was racial discrimination. The second one, we had an incredible team and the government support and everything behind us, and we finally won. And we built the first earth integrated school in Australia. It was amazing, absolutely, it was beautiful. Of course, it's all been you know, built over by now, no one knows what it was like, but it was the first earth integrated school in Australia. It's bad it's bad bad. Bad. Mm -hmm. So what happens, you know how Parliament House is concrete and then it's got grass on the sides and over the top? Yeah. So that's how this school was built. So it opened into a courtyard which faced north and had beautiful sunshine and everything else and normal entrance. But at the back of the, of the U, because it was in a U shape, the back of the U, it was um, there were windows quite high and it was um, earth on the top and earth on, on the side. So it was cool in summer and it was warm in winter. Oh, and, wow. Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, inshallah. I've got pictures of it and everything. So anyway, so and the little old lady who lived next door to us, she was uh, very uh, upset that we we're putting the school in there. She went on the media saying they're like cockroaches. You sweep them off the back step, send them back to the bush where they came from. And then we discovered that her grandson was a pilot who'd been captured by Saddam Hussein in the invasion of Kuwait, uh, the invasion of yeah, Kuwait. So what we did was we wrote letters to Saddam Hussein, all of our kids, and they went on the radio and Tom Uren took uh, these letters across. One of my son, my, I think it was my son who actually wrote out, read out the letter on ABC World Today um, saying that as Muslims we look after our neighbours and he's, we're trying to do dawah and it's important to establish Islam that he uh, respects the fact that he was a non-combatant um, in, in this whole process and that this pilot be released. And he was. So okay. Tommy Red took those letters over and it was one of the, he came and visited the school and said that if it wasn't for those letters, he wouldn't be free. So yeah, we're very happy with that. So I think, I think the other big achievements that we had was that we would start every day reading Quran. Every day we'd, we'd, we'd go through our parts of Juzama and uh, we have, um, I think it was um, uh, Sheikh Khalid who read Quran beautifully himself for us often. Um, the other thing, I think that we had a lot more Islamic studies and, and I think it was very family oriented. So we called our teachers uncle and aunt because we wanted the kids to know that the, the staff really cared about them. Another thing I think was that the, um, it was an inspiring time. It was a very inspiring time. 
So just watching the time here. The second school I established, um, New Orleans Hood Islamic Islamic College, that was in 1995. So the impetus for uh, New Orleans Huda was the fact that there was no high school at the time. And since we'd lost the primary school, we decided to set up a high school. The ch challenges for us were that the government gave us contaminated land knowingly, or the, the executive of, because we built it on, uh, Con on Bankstown Airport, the site of Bankstown Airport at Condell Park. And it's one of the lessons I've learned um, ever since then that not to offend people. So when we met with him, he reached across the table of his junior to shake my hand. And I um, I was under a very Salafi influence at the time. And so I just you know, did my hand like this and said, I'm sorry, I don't shake hands. Ten years later in the court, Supreme Court case that we that we ran, after discovering it was contaminated land, they, the barrister asked him, do you know who that lady is sitting over there? He said, I don't know what her name is, but I'll never forget her because she refused to shake my hand. Wow. So these kind of simple things that we stand on that are a sunnah, they're not critical, you can go and take wudu again, can cause long-term problems. So we established the school on land not realised it was contaminated. We built everything, so it was a massive achievement. We, myself and the community and my sons, who were teenagers at the time, we put in the electricity, the water, the sewerage. We built it all ourselves right the way through. It was 100 metres from the road. So it was a massive job to do. Um, and, again, there was a huge spirit in the school. Um, yeah. Again, politics, once we discovered that the uh, land was contaminated, we couldn't stay there, we had to move. And moving a school of 900 kids was, you know, it's hard enough establishing a school, let alone moving one next door. It's already got 900 kids. So we we tried a number of different places, local uh, Muslim community politics and definitely uh, state and federal politics uh, was against us. And so we had awful time. Uh, but alhamdulillah, we eventually moved to Strathfield, which is now the Australian International Academy School. Yes. I think the other challenge we had was that a lot of the influence at that time was about how Islam is all about what's halal and what's haram, what you have to do, what you can't do. So for a lot of the kids, they didn't like Islamic studies until we had a wonderful um, teacher who came and he talked to the heart and he reminded kids about what Islam was really all about. And those, a lot of the kids had never forgotten him. It was a wonderful time. I think for me, the other big issue was I had uh, six kids by this time. So running a Supreme Court case, running a school and looking after six kids uh, was quite a challenge. We also had established a childcare. So we had a primary school, a high school, boys high school, girls high school, primary, and we had them separated. Um, and the and of course then the fighting the Supreme Court case was was massive. So I think um, I, I think in terms of our achievements, um, some of the things I like to reflect back on, back in the early days, uh, we had um, we established a farm and the boys grew cucumbers. And they loved it. We had a lot of troublesome boys. Uh, we were known as the reject school because we took the kids that the the more wealthy and the more aspiring schools kicked out. These kids were beautiful kids, a lot of them. Yeah. And so yeah. um, we established a farm and they grew cucumbers. Uh, we um, and I think it was it was difficult because um, some of the kids were fine, but some of the troublesome kids gave us the really troublesome ones gave us a bit of a hard time in the beginning. Uh, Re-establishing the school, I think, was a challenge in the new place because it was very run down in Strathfield. Uh, one of the, the achievements that we did, though, was that we did get that school moved. We did re-establish it. When we moved, uh, we'd actually been given 10 days warning that the school was going to be locked out. So we had to move 35 buildings, boys' high school, girls' high school, primary, childcare, a huge library, we had a massive library, two science labs, two art and craft areas, two design and technology areas. Um, it was very, very challenging, but we managed to do it. We had um, chucks going all day and all night and the staff really pitched in and helped a lot too. And um, then we had, when we finally found a place to move to, uh, we only had a few weeks to get set up. We started late and then we ran the school in shifts. So if you've got determination and perseverance, you can deal with all of these things. Definitely. I think, um, I think um, so thanks to all of your <laughs> intentions and your heart, um, because against all odds, you still managed, all of you still managed. 
Alhamdulillah. And and I th um, the other thing I'm very proud of was that we had uh, um, the Shaka boys who were all, there were four of them. Three of them were very tall. One of them wasn't. And they were, loved basketball. And we had a lot of, uh, we really reached out to other schools and we made a terrific relationship with uh, Joey's, um, St. Ignatius School. I don't know what it's called, Joey's, but anyway, St. Ignatius School. And, sorry, Iggy's. And, um, uh, and so we played basketball with them. We used to have regular meetings between their year 11, 12 and our year 11, 12. Um, and talking about very open subjects, there was some very um, big issues at the time, uh, terrorism included. And we were very frank with them. Um, and they were quite amazed at the faith that our boys had that they didn't have in their own religion. Like, like you actually believe in it. You actually practice it. And they were envious. Um, and the highlight of that was uh, when our boys were invited to play at their school and the whole school turned out for a massive basketball match. We thrashed them. <laughs> so we were very happy. We came home, you know, with um, absolutely feeling that we hadn't let the side down at all. And, uh, and, and they actually invited me back to give the end of year speech um a couple of years later and they the women were shocked the mothers of the school were shocked because there'd never been a woman on the stage before and never one definitely wearing a hijab and giving the speech that was it was quite historic so i think we had a good effect so that was one yeah. thing and i think the other thing was that there was a documentary made about it and a lot of people found that um inspiring the difficulties that we had that was called silma school and um still around you can google it and find it yeah, maybe I can share yeah, it onto the camera. Yeah. Sorry, I'm yeah. echoing. Am I echoing on your yeah. side as well? No, no, that's all right. And uh, I think the other thing we had, which was good, was um, the teachers really were dedicated to the kids. I, I keep in touch with some of these teachers still. And um, they're passionate about the kids. They're passionate about teaching. Um, one of the teachers, I never realised this. I saw him just a couple of weeks ago. And he said his wife told me, and she, she met him at the school. They were both teachers at the school and they're married. Um, he, she said, I don't think you realise, but he used to get to school at four o'clock in the morning and crawl under the fence. He was so dedicated to that school. Uh, you know, I, just, I, I, was, I, I didn't even know that. So it, it, I think if you believe in what you're doing and you're passionate about the vision that you have, then I think you can go a long way. All right, so that, that's... Yeah, you've proven that's that. that. <laughs> so let's see how quickly we get to the questions. <laughs> okay, all right. okay all right. So second question. In your reflections on the field of Australian Islamic schooling since then, what's changed and how has the field evolved and what's still required? A lot has changed. We have magnificent buildings. I've got a lot more money. And I think the passion has gone out of it for a lot of people. And I think the people who are running the schools are more about ticking boxes and mm -hmm. handing out trophies and having that piece in the paper saying they got the highest marks and so on. And the love of the kids and the, the inspiring nature of, of teaching, which means that you reach out to an, another young soul and you help them on their way. I think the teachers are doing it, but I don't think the school's helping them in it. I think the school's getting in the way as much as they can to try and make it difficult for them to do that so i think there's a lot more professionalism we have a whole lot more teachers there's a lot more research we know what we're doing a lot more but we we've forgotten what we're really doing it for and i think mm -hmm. that's the biggest issue well, um, inshallah we can revive the spirit that you've had during the establishment phase okay so did i answer all of the second question yeah i guess so um well, what advice would you give to those in the field today about achieving the promise of Islamic schooling? My advice is to, to people who really want to see Islamic schools is to go back to the drawing board. Why are you doing it? I, I've already started doing this. So I'm happy to share it. But what is your vision for an ideal school? What is your vision for the child that leaves the school. And I'm not talking about getting into university because you can get it. Look, I've gone through lots of different university degrees and anybody can get into university if they really want to. But the but university isn't everything anyway because a lot of people come out graduates and they don't really know that that's what they actually want to do. 
And yes. often university doesn't really prepare them for a job. So it's about getting a job. And then maybe it's not the job you want anyway. Schooling is about nurturing young people to develop their identity, to find out who they are. And I think what teachers need to do is to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what, what, what is my ideal? What do I want a young person that I meet 20 years later after they've finished school with me to say, Miss or Mr or Sir, you helped me to discover myself. You helped me to believe in myself. You taught me to love my religion. You helped me find the skills that I need. What is it that you want them to say? Just map it all out. And what is it that you want your ideal school to have? Not the buildings, not, not but what do you want it to do? What, what, how do you want it to, to care for those kids? What are the things that are missing? What, what are the aspects that you really need to be able to help the kids into the future? So write them down. I've already started and I'm happy to share it. Um, write it all down and then get yourself ready. Get yourself ready professionally. Get yourself ready personally because we all know kids. They can see somebody who can't cope. And if you want to be able to help kids, you've got to give something to them. If you want to love kids, you have to love yourself first. You yes. can't give something you haven't got. So yes. go on your own personal journey yourself. I, mean, I, if I, I think one of the, the, the title of this was, if I could do something differently, what would I do? Right. And I, there's a lot of things that I'd like to do differently. I mean, for a start, I was pretty naive. <laughs> I was um, not looking after myself physically, emotionally, mentally. Um, and I think those are things you really need to do. Um, I, I hadn't really understood or got the grasp of Arabic and what a magnificent language it was. So if I could have my my bucket list before I started a school, it would be to master Arabic. I've, I've already got a master's in Islamic studies, but I need to do a lot more. I think I've got a, enough knowledge now to get started, but not for a curriculum. Um, Find people that share your passion but also have the professional capacity to be able to deliver the different things that a school needs. And I'm not involved in politics. I'm not going to bring on their family. I'm not doing it for the money. But I'm doing it because they believe in your vision and have a vision. Yes. If I could yes. do it again, I, I think I know now what I wanted what I was reaching out for, but I couldn't put together in words. A shared vision. A shared vision. Yes. And I think the other thing that um, if I could do it again now would be to have a mentor, even if the person was not a Muslim at all, because the journey is tough. If you want to start something that's worthwhile, it's 60 hours a week, it's hardly any holidays, it's huge amounts of responsibility. You can't blame everybody else. You have to take responsibility for what happens. And I think um, if I could go back again, I'd have somebody who could watch me and say, look, you know, step back or now's the time or you're taking on too much or just cool down and, and just consolidate where you are now. It's a lot that you learn from experience. Um, and I'm ha I would love to mentor other people too, inshallah, if I get the chance. Oh, I, think oh, I think you're, you're mental, mental. I think a lot of people are <laughs> Sorry, it is echoing. Um, but I do want to say, even though it is titled What Would You Do Differently, it's all written and I think um, everything was done with purpose and the reason why you, you were able to achieve so much was because of who you were and what you've done and who you are and, you know, we can learn from our past but, inshallah, um, just hearing your stories, there's definitely nothing to regret um, and we have to... Thank you for all your contributions, mashallah. You've done so much for us. You're welcome. And can I just say that the existing people who are running the schools will eventually move on. And for yeah. those young people, those teachers who have a dream, who have a vision, and who are passionate about looking after young people, get yourself ready. As I said, personally, professionally, get that yeah. network that you need, get that mentoring that you need, academically, get everything you need to know to be able to make decisions wisely and then just be patient. Pray and be patient because eventually 
when you're given the opportunity, if Allah gives you that opportunity, you need to be able to step in there and make it happen. Because we have so many schools that are not reaching anywhere near their potential, unfortunately. Yeah, inshallah. Um, yeah, personal development definitely doesn't stop for any of us. No, it That's doesn't. Why. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sister Silma, for joining us. Um, I'm yep. sure the members have gained quite a bit. Uh, if the, if you do have any questions, so just talking to the members, if you do have any questions, just post them up. Um, inshallah, have you popped into the group, Sister Silma, and checked it out? No, I'm not sure which group it is. So I'll I'll have a look. Islamic School Educators. I think you're on it. You've been added right. onto it. Yeah. So have a look at it. Um, perhaps share with us some photos. I'd love to see some photos of the establishment phase. Oh, I'll have to dig them out of the files. It'll take me a couple of days, but I'll get them up there. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and I'll look for your documentary, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay. So I'll end it there. Um, there's quite a lot to reflect on. Uh, personally and collectively. So, inshallah, we'll all do that. Thank you, Sister Silma. You're welcome. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. I really appreciate it. No problem. Take care. Same to you. Take care. Bye. Thank you.